Well, I am really pleased to have the privilege to introduce Kate Weather. She's a certified nurse midwife in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and she's been practicing since 1999 and teaching at Emory's Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing since 2004. Having completed a dissertation focused on midwifery education and workforce, she's interested in working to build the midwifery workforce, not only to address provider shortages and maldistributions, but also to make the midwifery, water, midwifery model of care a standard available to all women. She has attended over 1,200 births and continues her clinical practice at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. She is president of the Georgia affiliate of the American College of Nurse Midwives, and she directs Emory's Nurse Midwifery Program. Please join me in welcoming Kate. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to my presentation, and happy International Day of the Midwife to all of you. Um, welcome to this discussion about how our program assesses clinical competency in our students. Preparing new nurse midwives and as many as possible is an essential strategy for continued progress towards meeting the World Health Organization's Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, and which has a specific focus on reproductive maternal, newborn, and child health. And while there's great progress being made toward that goal in terms of increasing the percentage of women whose births are attended by a trained attendant, and in terms of the health of newborns and children, WHO has indicated that nurses and midwives represent more than 50% of the current shortage of health workers and estimates that the world will need an additional 9 million nurses and midwives by the year 2030. The largest needs-based shortages of nurses and midwives are in Southeast Asia and Africa, but even in the U.S. and particularly in Georgia where I live, half of the counties lack an obstetrician or a certified nurse midwife. So what this means to me as a midwifery program director is that our program must continue to push its capacity while ensuring that students obtain the didactic and clinical opportunities that they need to be competent caregivers. The objectives of this discussion are listed here. Uh, we'll talk about what competency-based education is, why this approach is important for the preparation of midwives. Then I'll show you a couple of tools we use to ensure that our graduates are competent and that our program is not operating beyond capacity. Com Competency-based education is a flexible, individualized learning schedule focused on a student trajectory of improving performance towards well-defined standardized outcomes. Traditional educational strategies are often very school and teacher centric and very process focused. Whereas traditional education often has very structured schedules, sometimes with required readings or required class attendance, there are usually a specified number of clinical hours in which passing criteria involves, uh, may involve a certain number of required procedures and generally involves not scaring anybody. And then the class must patch, pass high stakes examinations each semester or term and at the end of the program. Many undergraduate and graduate clinical programs are designed this way. But in competency-based education, the focus is on meeting the learning needs of the individual and the timeline and the learning methods are more flexible. The point is for the student to be able to demonstrate progression and then mastery of the acquired skill content and the skills. Competency-based education is student-centered and outcomes focused. We need competency-based education for two main reasons. First, because of the word competency. Midwifery education programs are gatekeepers for the profession, and we wanna be sure that everybody who graduates from our programs um, is going to be safe and um, a wonderful practitioner. Um, not, and we're not gonna let them go and hurt somebody just because they completed some clinical hours and passed a test. While our board exams are effective for assessing knowledge and judgment to a large degree, they don't do a great job of capturing competency involving all of the complexities in a clinical setting, including not only knowledge and judgment, but also manual skills and professional behaviors. 
The other reason we need competency-based education is that it can help us evaluate students using standardized outcomes, despite the wide range of program and student-related factors that influence learning. The range of program factors includes different types of programs. Um, so in the US, there's an alphabet soup when it comes to different types of midwives. There are certified nurse midwives, certified midwives, certified professional midwives, community midwives. Um, and then there are different content delivery methods, distance programs versus on-site programs, full-time versus part-time study. And then sometimes there's a huge variance in student clinical opportunities. Some of our sites are busy, some provide care for higher risk people, and then sometimes students have good or bad luck as far as whether their call time is busy. We know that the hours don't necessarily match up to the quality of education. And then there are student factors, different learning styles, different work backgrounds, and a variety of life factors affecting how students are able to interact with the didactic material and with clinical practice. Anyway about it though, we would really like our students to have the same very basic skill set when they graduate. So as an example, my program at Emory is mostly face-to-face, -face, but there's so many variables that make it impractical to approach a group of students as if each had the same learning needs. Right now, in our first year cohort, we have 19 students finishing their second of four semesters, and they're a very diverse group. As far as prior work experience, 13 just completed their undergraduate nursing degree as a second degree program. Um, and they come from a variety of prior careers. One was a lactation counselor. Five of the group had prior nursing employment, four worked in labor and delivery, one was a birth center nurse manager, and one worked in the operating room. One worked as a childbirth educator and doula. In addition, there are four completing dual specialties or majors. There are two part-time students, Several have outside employment, and two of our students just had babies. As far as the clinical opportunities available to our students, they're also really variable. Clinical sites may be in a hospital or in a birth center, and these obviously require very different sets of skills and different time investments. Our preceptors are usually midwives, but sometimes there are nurse practitioners or physicians. So lots of variables. So it makes sense that the process of preparation is going to vary in order to meet the needs of each student. However, it's essential that the outcomes for all graduates are consistent. And this leads me to tell you about the tool that we use to help us evaluate those learning outcomes. The Midwifery Clinical Competency Assessment Tool, or MCAT, was developed as part of a faculty quality improvement effort designed to respond to student feedback that they didn't really know how to assess their, clini their clinical progress in the program. Students knew they needed to attend clinicals and show that they knew what they were doing, and they had access to some information about core competencies and about how many procedures they should aim to perform. But they wanted more specific goals and criteria that would reassure them that they were on track to be safe, competent providers. In addition to trying to do a better job of delineating performance expectations for both students and preceptors and faculty, the MCAT aims to ensure the quality of student midwifery preparation across domains of practice. And for practice directors, the MCAT can help to track the quality and quantity of clinical opportunities across clinical training sites, which is helpful for assessing program capacity. So here are the ingredients used to design the MCAT. Um, and I will get into a little bit more of each of these on the following slides. Um, I use the International Confederation of Midwives Essential Competencies for Basic Midwifery Practice uh, in 2013, which has since been updated. Uh, the World Health Organization Strengthening Midwifery Toolkit has a mid monitoring midwifery competencies self-assessment tool, and you'll see how our tool looks like that one. Um, ACNM, American College of Nurse Midwives, has core competencies for basic midwifery practice, and they use Patricia Benner's novice to expert model. The basic framework of the MCAT was borrowed from the International Confederation of Midwives Essential Competencies, 
for basic midwifery practice. And shown here are the four categories of the eight updated 2018 competency pro for frameworks. And here's a sample page from the World Health Organization's Strengthening Midwifery Toolkit, Monitoring Comp Midwifery Competency Self-Assessment Tool. The, companies, the competencies listed on the left are from ICM. It's a really great list of very specific competencies that are required for safe midwifery practice. This tool, including the format, is from WHO. This is a self-assessment tool, and you can see that they use very broad definitions of competence and confidence. Um, I like this tool a lot, but I struggled a little with the broadness of the definition of competence. I wasn't completely comfortable with how knowledge and skills were interchangeable for all of the competencies, and I wanted a more specific indication of the student's level of independence and their ability to deal with complexity. Also, I've worked with a lot of students whose levels of confidence bore, confidence bore no relationship with their actual skills and abilities, sometimes too much, sometimes too little. So I thought that our tool would be OK without the confidence ratings. So I cross-referenced the specific competencies of the ICM Essentials with ACNM's list of more general core competencies and made sure that our list um, a covered bowls and B was specific to practice in the US. Here you can see some examples of how the ACM core competencies were matched to ICM essentials and what those translated into for the MCAT. So the ACM component of midwifery care is confirmation and assessment of labor and its progress. The related ICM essentials are physiology of the stages of labor and indicators of latent and active phases of labor. And the specific competencies we identified for the MCAT are those listed. Conducts a thorough interval subjective history, thoroughly reviews health record, including lab work and diagnostic tests, performs a focused physical exam and in labor, including abdominal assessments for fetal position and descent, pelvic exam for dilation, effacement, descent, presenting part, fetal position, um, I guess you can read the words. For the self-assessment piece of the tool, I wanted to use a definition of competence that was especially relevant to nursing and midwifery practice. So I looked to the work of nursing theorist Patricia Benner. In the images on this slide, you can see pictorial summaries of her work in describing the clinical knowledge and behaviors of novices, experts, and everyone in between. In general, you can see that while a novice makes decisions using rules or algorithms to follow in a relatively painstaking way, experts enjoy a more instantaneous understanding of larger patterns, typically based on the totality of relevant and interacting data rather than on a formal thought process. The MCAT list of competencies reflects some of the complexity of behaviors from Benner's definitions, but they're also based on agreement among the midwifery program's faculty regarding the expected clinical performance of a finishing midwifery student. So Benner's terminology and our MCAT definitions differ both in substance and in the typical time frame for achievement. I'm not sure Benner would approve of our definitions, but um, we're like, for example, for instance, where she allows at least two or three years of employment prior to the achievement of competence. Um, our programs are not necessarily that, that long. Um, so the MCAT's definition of competence focuses on the efficiency, flexibility, and independence a student might acquire during, the, during their two years or less of midwifery education. And here are the definitions we agreed upon. They can be best understood if we use an example. So I'll use the example of a student midwife catching a baby. A novice might need to review hand maneuvers while she washes her hands, and the preceptor might need to talk her through the process or even apply hands over the student's hands. The student took part in the birth, but the precepting midwife was clearly in charge of the situation. An advanced beginner has replayed the birth in her mind 100 times, so if the birth is very straightforward, no help is needed for the hand maneuvers. The student's hand maneuvers are in order and are rather mechanical, and all is well as long as nothing funny happens. The preceptors confirm that it was time for delivery and that the student would try to do the birth without as much assistance 
and stands by just in case. A competent student knew that even though the mother was five centimeters dilated just minutes ago, she better put gloves on when she hears the mother making pushing sounds. She doesn't need prodding to ask the mother to change position if the fetal heartbeat indicates the need, and she can catch the baby in any position. She automatically manages some gushing of blood during the third stage, and her preceptor feels the weight of training lifted. The student is now a helpful person whose presence lightened the preceptor's workload instead of adding more work. A proficient or expert, expert student is beyond that description. She's encountered enough situations that there aren't as many new situations to encounter. She's built up confidence that she can handle problems that arise, and she may serve as an experienced resource to others providing care. So now we can have a look at the, the MCAT tool. The front page includes the ratings and definitions we've been discussing, and it also tracks didactic coverage of content. So you can see on the top are the definitions, and on the bottom in the table are the courses um, that, that we have in our program, both the clinical courses and the courses that are not directly midwifery, but that definitely impact knowledge and school skills related to clinical practice. Each domain is presented separately on the following pages. So the domains are like well woman, antepartum, interpartum, postpartum, newborn, um, and abortion care. Each domain, um, so this presentation is just going to show you the first pages for each domain of practice. Um, some are more than one page. Here's the first page of competencies related to preconception care, family planning, and well woman care. As you look across the page, you'll see on the left the competency item and then the course where content is covered didactically. We wanted to track our content coverage to make sure we were getting it all in. Um, then there is a column for first clinical exposure that typically involves some observation in the clinical setting and then the competency definitions. From top to bottom, you'll see that the top of the form generally has the most basic competencies, such as those relating to normal routine assessments, and that the end of the list of items for each domain generally has things that are more like complications. Here you can see abnormal uterine bleeding, polycystic ovarian disease, pelvic pain, etc. We expect that all of the competencies on the tops of the page will be related, rated by the student as at least competent by the end of the program, and that some in the bottom may not because they may not be encountered as regularly in the clinical setting. There are some better descriptions of this um, in some other domains. So here's the domain having to do with pregnancy care. At the bottom of the page, you can see an example of an item in which the student may not become competent managing before graduation and true uterine fetal death. If a student doesn't have the experience of carrying someone with a fetal demise during the space of their academic program, they should be sure to consult others for assistance after they graduate. From the faculty or program standpoint, we know to include case studies and lab simulations for items like this that are less likely to occur for every student to experience. There are some common items that require competent ratings, such as identification and collaboration, collaborative management of preeclampsia. Here's the first page of the labor and birth competencies. An example of labor and birth experience that students should not have the opportunity to, to, to achieve competence in, within the clinical setting at least, is management of cord prolapse. So we definitely hope that they're going to make great progress in most of the columns, most of the rows, I mean, but not all of them. And here's, um, on the next slide, is the first page of the postpartum care items. And there's also one for newborn care. And so that I won't belabor these, um, here is the first page of abortion and loss related care. The last pages of the tool allow for cumulative evaluation of student progress towards competency goals evaluation of students' strengths and future learning goals, and endorsement by students, faculty, and preceptors. 
As far as logistics for filling out the form, students are instructed to update the entire form prior to each site visit, which is generally once per semester in our program, so that preceptors and faculty can review the form and discuss student progress during the site visit. This is what a completed form might look like after one of the earlier semesters in our program. This student started her interpartum rotation in May, and you can see that she gained a lot of good experience during just that month because so many of the rows have been filled in with that first clinical exposure and with some level of competency. If I was doing a site visit with this student, I would see that she has a balance of independence and support for some of the more hands-off parts of labor assessments, and that she's more of a novice, not independent at all, when it comes to almost anything that's hands-on. She hasn't had an opportunity for some items. It isn't surprising that she hasn't dealt with a face presentation or a breech birth yet because those aren't as common. But the fact that she didn't fill out anything for nutrition and hydration is something for us to discuss. We would talk about how hospital policies can impact comfort, dignity, and labor outcomes and how best to navigate those kinds of policies for different laboring women. After using the tool for a few cohorts now, um, there are some tips. Um, students complete self-assessments at regular intervals. Uh, we use this form each semester during the student's site visit. The student fills out the form because it's long and because part of the point is for them to see where they've made progress and where they need to focus in the future. And then student ratings are verified with preceptor and faculty observers. Some have suggested that they would prefer an electronic version of this form. The paper version has worked well for us. It's easy to review during site visits. And then students are asked to upload a scanned copy to our online learning platform. We use Canvas um, at the end of each semester. However, I am about to start trying to use electronic data entry through SurveyMonkey in order to make the tool a little friendlier to students. It may also help with summarizing the data since the results can be downloaded to an Excel file. Another tip is that the MCAT isn't meant to replace more frequent clinical evaluations or journals. It's really more of a tracking tool that evaluates overall progress, but we use a different evaluation form for more frequent updates, usually at least a couple of times during each semester. I'll show you part of our evaluation tool on the next slide. The third tip is that qualified students may not achieve competence for every item by program end. Uh, we've discussed rare opportunities like cord prolapse or abortion-related care, um, at least rare for midwives in Georgia, that may be better addressed through simulation and didactic instruction. So the, just FYI, this is a part of the tool that we use at intervals during the semester to facilitate communication between the student, the preceptor, and the faculty. You can see the rating scale on the bottom is the same as the one we use for the MCAT, but that the clinical objectives in the middle of the page are much more general. Uh, there are some limitations to the tool. Um, they may also be understood as challenges. Um, the length of the tool, uh, it says 10 pages, it's really more than that, um, can seem overwhelming at first to students and preceptors. Um, but once they start filling it out, it's really not as bad as it looks since the items are so familiar. We'll still see if SurveyMonkey helps with this process. Second, the self-assessments are subject to over and underestimates. Uh, we discussed how some students may over underestimate their performance. Some of the ratings may need to be edited during the site visit to make them more realistic. And then in my last cohort, I had the experience of a student trying to manipulate the system using her ratings. She wanted to have extra clinical experience, so she rated herself lower than was necessary on many items. Uh, we needed to have a conversation about trust, and I needed to assure her that she wouldn't be set free from our program until she had the opportunities to increase her competencies in key areas. The third main challenge is determining realistic and adequate expectations for domain level for your program. So for example, a goal for each student during semesters one and two might be um, that they achieve 70% 
of ambulatory competencies will be scored as advanced beginner or above. And then in semester three, 70% of well women and prenatal competencies will be scored competent or above, and 70% of interpartum or postpartum competencies will be scored advanced beginner or above. By our last semester, semester four, we would like at least 90% of the company's competencies to be scored as competent above or above. Um, although I recognize that other programs may have other preferences for student goal setting. So that's the MCAT, and now we'll just talk briefly about the semester summary tool. So the semester summary tool is like partner tool for the MCAT, and it's used to tally the data from the whole student cohort. So this is the first page, and it summarizes performance over the first two semesters of our program. Uh, our program has lab simulations in the first semester, but no actual clinical work, so those are combined for the sheet. You can see that each page can be used to see each student's course grade, their clinical competency levels by domain and overall, and then other bits of data like birth numbers and clinical hours. The numbers under each domain column are the number of MCAT items in which the student achieved an adequate degree of competency. So for the semester pictured, faculty wanted students to achieve at least 70% of the MCAT items as novice or above. The color coding shows how well each student did overall. So the green means that students achieved at least 70% novice overall, as we were hoping. Uh, yellow is for students achieving between 50 and 69%, and red is for under 50%. Um, the student participated in few clinical hours and was exposed to fewer experiences. It can be used by program directors to get a view of an individual's performance and of the cohort's performance and it can identify gaps in the program or in the program's clinical opportunities. For example, our, our program found that students were, get, were, were not getting much exposure to loss and abortion, so we knew that we needed to add in some case studies and some simulation around those items on the MCAT. Also, some clinical sites offer more mostly pregnancy-related care and little exposure of students to gynecological concerns. It can also be used to determine program capacity. Students really should be green. And if they aren't due to program versus student factors, then the program director needs to take another look at how many clinical spaces they have to offer their next cohort. And that is what I wanted to tell you. So I'm happy to take questions and suggestions. Okay, I have some questions like, for you. Okay. Um, first, a comment that Catherine made toward the beginning of your presentation. She said that uh, when you were talking about board exams and how they don't assess all skills, she said they also don't assess effective skills very well. Do you um, want to make any comment on that? Um, I completely agree. I will say that uh, in the second, in the new update from the ICM Essentials, they actually took out the um, affective skills because they're so subjective and very hard to evaluate. Um, so I'm not sure that I've figured out anything better for that either. <laughs> All right. Um, Sheila asked, uh, is self-assessment done by self-peer self -peer clinician or educator? It is done by the self. The students evaluate themselves, um, but then the, their evaluations should be reviewed with both their preceptor, we, and we encourage them to make sure that they review it with preceptors who have, um, who they've spent the most time with, and also with their faculty site visitors. Right, and Lorraine made the comment agreeing with you, self-assessments are notoriously over or underestimated. Yeah, they and, sure are. Definitely, like we've had, I've had the most, you know, the best students in the class saying that they just, they, they weren't sure. I think that they were rating their confidence or um, they just, they, they were, bringing their confidence into the evaluation. And what I do in those cases is go back 
with them to the definitions and if they really read through um, can you do this as long as everything is straightforward and your preceptor is standing there then um, you know then they're advanced beginner they're not novice anymore and um, just some students are really modest and then there are some who rate themselves as expert on way more things <laughs> than, uh, and Lorraine just commented exactly it is often about confidence so it really is um donna had a comment that the paperwork that you were showing is similar to the competencies that they use in the uk so i thought that was interesting really that's cool i was actually really interested in hearing um more about how people would use something like this in their setting what would be you know some of the differences because I know that our midwifery might vary so much between countries. Mm -hmm. And with our education being nurse midwifery, you know, I, it's things that I would love to learn more about. Okay, and then Catherine asked if any of Emory's programs use Typhon. We do use Typhon, and I had asked if we could put this into Typhon, um, and the answer was no. And I'm trying to remember why they told me no. Um, I think there were, I don't remember why, I think it was too many questions or too many competencies, not sure. Okay, and Catherine also had a question about primary care and Catherine I'm not sure what your question was I believe you're asking if primary care skills are assessed for competency is that what you're trying to ask that's what I was thinking when I saw um, her question and I think that they're integrated somewhat into the preconception family planning and well woman care um, it's definitely very broadly, though. OK, so she says on the scoring sheet, I don't see a competency for primary care. It's not a separate section. That's true. OK, so you have it integrated. And Megan makes the comment, we use very similar uh, competencies at MCU, which I believe is that Midwives College of Utah or CPM midwifery. Very cool. And she says yes. And Catherine made another comment that there's a lack of opportunity in many programs. I believe she's still commenting on primary care. Care. Um, I agree. And sometimes students don't recognize their opportunities for primary care. Um, with a lot of the domains or competencies, we really need to um, like people don't necessarily know that they're providing preconception care either mm -hmm. until you really explain what that is and you know if you ask somebody when they plan to become pregnant and the whether they be plan to become pregnant in the next year and then um, try to help them work out the answer to that question in a practical way either to promote say pregnancy or prevent pregnancy, that's preconception care. So they don't know to check that box until they have a better understanding of what it is. And primary care tends to not be a separate visit for these, um, for the students in midwifery settings. So they have to understand that when they're trying to determine if a common discomfort of pregnancy is, you know, asthma, that that counts as a primary care visit. Mm -hmm. And Margaret asks about home birth. I believe maybe asking if there's any assessment of home birth competency. I will say I wish I could say that we had that and we don't. It is, um, I was just attending a, a session on for the, these meetings that was on home birth. That was so interesting. And we are way short on home birth. Um, in Georgia where I live, there is very little home birth and um, well certified nurse midwives which are the only kinds of midwives that are licensed in our state um, certified nurse midwives may perform home births but cpms are not even licensed in georgia so um, home birth is not common enough for it to be something that we offer routinely in our program but it would definitely hopefully be included for other, other programs. 
as it Celine is comments, sad. that's sad. <laughs> it's really Definitely. sad. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do for uh, for our scope of practice in Georgia. And is for the school, is part of that driven by um, insurance? Because I know with Teaching for Frontier, um, our student malpractice insurance will not cover for them to attend a home birth, even as an observer. That is also an issue for sure. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges for us when I think of being able to offer home birth. Um, as much as I think it would be important and really add a lot to the future practice of students to be able to attend home births, it would be, um, it, there aren't enough of them here to make it a practical requirement. It could be something that when someone wants to attend, they would need to do it outside of student insurance, as you're saying. Um, but they're, most of the students are not getting so much, so many clinical experiences that they have a lot of extra time to be on call um, for an individual person's home birth. I know that's so sad. I hate saying that. Um, yeah. But I think that we would have to have a little more space in our program for, um, I don't know, I hate to even use the word extra there because I think it's essential. It's just not realistic for us to offer it. And Tammy from New Zealand said, oh, that's hard with no insurance for students attending home birth. And Tara, Tara Matti, the students in my country would have clinical attachment at primary care facilities. Oh, oh that's, that's great. nice. <laughs> That's great. Right now we have a dual, a lot of students doing a dual specialty. So they have a lot of primary care time. Um, we're in the process of phasing that out and then we're really gonna have to um, come up with some more opportunities that are focused on primary care for sure. All right, are there any other questions that I have missed or that have not come in yet? Okay, I believe that's everyone. Oh, no, here came another one. How does your MCAT help with accreditation? Uh, well, actually, we put together the MCAT the year that we were re-accrediting, and it was super helpful. Um, it's been helpful a number of times when we were trying to um, Trying to, I mean, it's so many questions, it's, it's handy for answering. Um, whether it's how do we measure student competence or um, what opportunities do our students have, we, I can just show them the numbers. Um, so it was very helpful with accreditation. Well, that sounds like an excellent um, asset to have. I really liked your forms. Thank you. All right. It looks like we are at the end of our questions. So I am going to stop the recording. And thank you so much, Kate, for this excellent presentation. It's been very valuable. Well, thank you all for attending and for helping to make this work and for your great questions and comments.